Welcome to Synthaholics. This is your host, David Duncan. And with me, Aaron? Holly? Um, looks like it's just me. So, uh, yeah. This is going to be a short one, guys, uh, as I am by myself this evening. Uh, we do have a bit of pre recorded audio from the last time we were at Holly's house. Holly did ask me some questions uh, that kind of from a maybe from the point of view of a Trekkie who maybe isn't as deep into things, and she was she's asking me some spur-of-the-moment questions, and I was giving some very spur-of-the-moment answers, and these are uh, these will be played later. Uh, we didn't pre-plan any of that. It just kind of happened while we are waiting for Aaron to get to come over to Holly's so that, that last time we recorded at her house when we recorded Hope and Fear. Again, because it was on the same day we recorded Hope and Fear, Hope and Fear, we had a little bit of clipping issues, so there will be some clipping issues, in this episode as well, once we get to that clip. But what I did want to uh, talk to you a little bit about was, uh, before we get started, was uh, last night I did a, a Facebook Live, which was kind of fun. A couple of people joined in, and I was saying, uh, hey, what kind of things would you like to hear about, or what kind of things would you like to hear me rant about by myself for a little while? So uh, a couple of the things I got, one was uh, how come there are no superheroes in Star Trek? And so, my take on superheroes in Star Trek is that uh, well, superheroes are a very specific genre. Uh, superheroes are, I mean, it, they're basically a genre unto themselves. Like, sure, superhero movies can, like, you know, fall into science fiction, almost always action, sometimes drama, depending on how they're done. But uh, superhero films and superhero TV shows are about the superhero. Uh, Star Trek is about us in the future. Uh, Star Trek is about us exploring and you know, seeking out new... It's not about... I mean, sure, there's supernatural things in Star Trek and, and you know, science fiction. There's technology way out of our, our, our bounds. But at the same time, uh, it, it's about us. It's about what, what we hope we can accomplish in the future working together. And so it's not, it's just a totally different uh, genre. It's There aren't superheroes in it because it's not a superhero genre piece. Um, it's a science fiction piece about humans, and almost, you know, I, I, I love humans, and because, you know, I am human, and all of you are human, uh, but, you know, sometimes Star Trek almost relies too much on humans. I, I kind of wish sometimes we'd see more aliens in Star Trek, so, um, you know, uh, Discovery's done a good job adding some neat aliens and neat-looking things on the, on the bridge, and so hopefully we'll see more of that uh, in the coming months. In years, as you know, uh, the news out of Star Trek Las Vegas is, is that we're getting they, they want to have like tons of Star Trek TV shows on CBS All Access so that there'll be Star Trek going on all year round. And to me, that's the best thing, that's the best news possible. I'd love to have a new Trek year round, and that would give us so much to talk about on the podcast. We may not even be able to talk about you know old Trek, which would be interesting, always talking about new and and the, the new things coming out. That would just be you know, endlessly fascinating and, and so much fun to talk about. Uh, you know, another reason superheroes don't exist is we already have like things that are almost better than superheroes. We've got Q. John Delancey, you love him playing Q, and, you know, Q could snap Superman out of existence in a second. Uh, I mean, he, he, that's closest thing we get to, like, a superhero, like, that kind of almost magical power. Uh, the omnipotent, all-knowing power of the Q. So they could do, you know, when you have something as powerful as the Q, you don't even need a superhero. <laughs> and then as far as, like, someone who's superhuman, I mean, you've got Khan, uh, Khan Noonien Singh. Uh, from the eugenics wars, you know, of course you've seen Space Seed, Star Trek in the Darkness, and uh, of course the original Star Trek II, The Wrath of Khan. So, you know, he's he's a Superman. He's, you know, basically souped up on whatever Captain America smoking, makes him super strong and, you know, makes super ambitious and 
and vicious as well. So it's it's, it's interesting seeing. Uh, I mean, he's kind of like a superhero if you want to look at it that way. Super villain, anyway. He took over the world, and then he fled. And he took over the Enterprise, and then he was given a world to take over. SETI Alpha Five, SETI Alpha Six, something like that. I always get them confused because they always think they're on the one in Star Trek Two, but they're on the other one. So it, it always like kind of throws me. And I'm I'm not at a computer right now to look look that up immediately. So uh, one of the SETI Alphas. So that's it for superheroes. I mean, I don't have a whole lot to say about superheroes in Star Trek. I, there's just, uh, it, I mean, it's just two different genres. I don't I don't know I don't know why there would need to be superheroes in Star Trek. Personally. If you if you think there should be superheroes in Star Trek, let me know. Or or, or are you talking about star, uh, superheroes in Star Trek as in like their pop culture? Because as far as Star Trek goes, we don't know much about the pop culture of Star Trek at all. I mean, the only thing we know is they like to paint, uh, do poetry, and um, play classical instruments. And usually, when they're playing the classical instruments, they're playing you know classical music along with it. And uh, they quote Shakespeare a lot. So like all their all their pop culture is like. You know, it's old to us, and so it's got to be ancient to them. So, oh, we also have, we also know that like Captain Proton, which I don't, and I assume that's a modern retro to them. But uh, beyond that, we don't know a whole lot about Star Trek pop popular culture. So I don't know if you were asking in, in the sense of uh, superheroes in their popular culture or just superheroes in general in Star Trek. So, um, yeah, that's that's one thing. Another thing I got, uh, I was asked was to talk about. Um, the future of like kind of streaming platforms because uh, with Disney starting their own streaming platform and you know that's just streaming platforms is just how things are gonna go. Um, I, I worked at uh, I worked at a cable company for a while and um, there are times where um, the negotiation between the cable company and like the channel will break down. Like the local channels, like CBS or, or whatever, like wh- whoever plays the bills here uh, on local channels. I haven't had TV in years, so I don't remember what channel here normally plays the bills here in Buffalo. But as an example, like that, ch- after a couple of years, that channel will go up to um, need to be renewed, and there'll be a, uh, a contract going with the cable company and the the channel, and the channel will try to negotiate for higher higher rate, and the cable company will probably try not to do it because they're trying to keep or you know the, the total cost down for all the packages. So what happens is sometimes the channel gets pulled, uh, and and they just won't show up on the cable station until that is you know uh, that wage or whatever has been negotiated out. And so with with the way things are going now. Um, CBS All Access was, you know, sure, the pay channels like HBO and Stars, they had their own app, so you could get those. But CBS, I guess, kind of being the first regular channel to do it, uh, because they have a, a two tiered program and they have, look, people are paying us six bucks a month or five ninety nine a month or whatever the base pay is. So, like, they're they can have a number and they can bring this to the cable company and be like, hey, look, people are paying us this much for our channel. Um, just just to stream it. And so they'll probably use that as a negotiation tactic to try to raise, you know, get that same amount of money from the cable company. And that's what I think is going to be happening with, with, with the other stuff going too. Uh, with Disney uh, doing it, um, you know, uh, they're also talking about making another streaming service for, like, the DC shows, uh, the New Titans thing that's coming out is going to be, I think it's supposed to be on that, and some other DC shows that are specifically going to be set up too. Um you know, on this uh, new streaming platform with these, with these platforms, it's just, it just feels sort of inevitable that, uh, that things are going to be moving this way, especially with CBS all access kind of getting the ball rolling. I think more and more channels are going to have their own, their own pay thing. And they'll be, you know, and in, in, to incentivize people switching to that versus the cable company, they'll probably be putting exclusive shows on them. I feel like it's just kind of how it's going to go. Uh, I mean, I personally haven't paid for cable in years, so I usually like to do a roulette-style system where I, you know, subscribe to one channel, I'll show I'm is running, then I'll switch to another one, then I'll switch to another one, then I'll switch to another one. I just keep rolling with it to watch the shows I want to watch, and that way I'm only subscribed to one or two things at a time at most. Greed kind of gets factored in, uh, especially when it comes to Disney. It's, Disney did some kind of shady things with... I can't remember if it was Solo or Episode 8. It might have been Episode 8. But they were, like, 
trying to like up you know it's a movie that was gonna make a bunch of money anyway they're trying to up how, how much how many theaters each theater had to show it on and they were trying to really monopolize on things like that and when i read about it it didn't seem like you know it was really good practice this is a movie that's already gonna make a ton of money anyway and uh if they if the movie theaters didn't acquiesce to all these you know raised demands um, for for showing Star Wars, and they wouldn't get Star Wars at all. So, I'm not a super big fan of how Disney is has been kind of treating the the movie theater um, in general uh, now with Episode Eight, and I'm not sure if that changed with Solo or not too. But uh, they seem to be doing that, and then them doing a, a pace, a, you know, a, a pay channel that's a streaming service that's like, huh, you know, uh, I mean, for me, since I don't get cable, it would be interesting to get uh, if there's anything I want to watch on Disney. And like I said, I could swap this out for one of the other things. When you know, Star Trek, I could cancel all access. When Star Trek's not on, I could watch that for a while and switch back. As someone who doesn't have cable, uh, these options are interesting to me because it just gives me options to watch stuff if I can get an app and just watch it over the internet. Versus, you know, actually being subscribed for, for TV. It would be nice if some of these became, like, bundled. <laughs> and, like, you could, like, bundle stream, like, you know, bundle these streaming services so you don't have to pay as much for them. I don't know. Because like, if everyone's got a streaming service, this is going to go... It's going to be so much more expensive than cable, it's not even funny. So, I don't know. I really hope that uh, there's a better way. Like, you know, choose channels a la carte and just get a special kind of package like that. Or, you know... Uh, some kind of online conglomerate site where you can pick which things you're going to stream and just pay for those and get like a, a some kind of bundle price. Because right now, with everything being a la carte, with all these different companies doing their own streaming service, CBS, Disney, CW, I guess, like it's just going to be insane. Uh, the, the cost of just keeping up with shows uh, going forward. So yeah, those are my thoughts on superheroes and Star Trek and the streaming services coming out. Um, you know, I, I feel like it's really inevitable that uh, more streaming services will be coming. I just hope there's a way it can be handled better in the future so it doesn't cost so much. Because uh, the way it's looking right now, it's just going to be an arm and a light to do anything unless you do a like a rotating uh, thing with your with your pay channels. So uh, here, I'll go ahead and play the clip of me and Holly, uh, or sit the Holics short as we called it, and uh, I hope you enjoy. Thanks for listening. Welcome to a Synthaholic Short. I'm your host David Duncan, and with me is nobody. Nobody. Uh, are you? Are you Arya Stark? <laughs> I'm no one. I'm nobody. I am no one. I am no one. <laughs> are you going to murder me? Well, I wouldn't tell you if I were. <laughs> Oh, you got to be ninja about it. <laughs> Although, I wouldn't kill. I would doubt. I don't think I'd ever kill you. But I'm not on your list. You don't say my name that night, thinking about me. <laughs> no, I don't. <laughs> well, that's good. For the Game of Thrones podcast, we haven't started yet. <laughs> <laughs> Hi, it's Holly Michelle. Hey. Hey. How are you doing? I'm good. How are you? I'm sleepy. I sleepy too. <laughs> My husband and I went and got ice cream a couple hours ago, and <sighs> so good, Zonked. so sugary. And now we are we're like drained. And he went up to bed. He was gonna sit in and talk with us, but he was like, "Nope." I'm he, even, he even braved through a Voyager episode. He did, and he does not do science fiction. Science fiction, yeah. And actually, we're hopefully gonna hear from him at some point about one of the only science fiction. Uh, films he enjoys. Yeah. So, but yeah, he did. He sat through Star Trek. He really doesn't like Star Trek. I watched, you know, the new JJ films, and he's like, not. He's like, no. I'm gonna go find something else to do. That's crazy because those are like general audience type films, not uh, not Star Trek films. Mm. But uh, you wanted to do something tonight that was uh, a little bit a little bit different and kind of on the shorter side of things. Yeah. You know, I don't. I haven't watched everything. And I, I'm sure you have listeners who have watched everything, but I haven't. So um, there, I, th- I thought it'd be fun to kind of ask you just a couple questions. You know, you are like put me on the spot. Encyclopedia for Star Trek. I try to be. So I'm not perfect um, though. <laughs> <laughs> this is like off the cuff, by the way. We didn't like sit down and say, oh, I'm going to ask you all these questions. I really don't even know what I'm going to ask him yet. <laughs> um, we're just kind of burning some time. Woo! So, let's see. I love the Borg. Mm-hmm. The Borg fascinate me. 
and you gonna be probed? I, no, <laughs> no. I'll, I'll be fascinated at a distance. <laughs> okay, will not join the collective. <laughs> um, but I like them as villains, as a concept, and as a concept. So, can you can you tell us how the Borg came to be? Well, <laughs> the. Uh... Well, that's an interesting. It's interesting because uh, there's a there's a book book trilogy called uh, the Destiny trilogy. I don't remember all the names of the books of the oh, Destiny have a trilogy, one. but the Destiny trilogy goes through how the Borg were, were uh, created, and it even goes through the, the demise of the Borg, which is really interesting. So it's a it's a it's a three book series that that delves into how the Borg came to be and how. Um, how they ended up uh, getting wiped out. Uh, so it's, it, it was interesting. So like it, it, it started, I mean, there's, it's not canon, uh, because it's the books, uh, it would technically be memory beta, which is like all non-canon Star Trek stuff. But like the gist of it was that, um, humans on the Columbia, which is the sister ship of the NX-01 Enterprise and in, okay. in Archer's time, they were in the Romulan war. They got damaged and, they like landed on some planet and there were hyper advanced aliens there and something happened and they they ended up ma- making them live for a long time and they ended up kind of becoming the Borg like mm. the, the, through through melding. I don't remember exactly how it happened because it's been like six seven years since I read the books, okay. but I highly recommend them. They're really good series because it delves with characters between Enterprise, Next Gen, DS Nine. Uh, it's it's really really fun and really well done. So okay. uh, I, I I would enjoy that book. I would uh, encourage you also to read Before Dishonor first because Before Dishonor takes place right before chronologically in the book series, mm-hmm. and th- this uh, involves Seven of Nine, Spock, the Planet Killer, and the Borg. Cool. So it's it, it the, that was a fun jaunt as well. Huh. Very neat. And so uh, earlier you said that the books aren't really canon. So the books are st- stand apart from the TV series. Is that what you mean? Yeah, um, uh, canon. Everything in Star Trek that's canon is um, pretty much just uh, what's seen on screen. Uh, even the Discovery books that are being written for the Discovery show aren't technically canon, although they're trying to adhere to canon between both the original show and Discovery as much as they can. Oh, okay. So uh, technically, none of the books are canon, but. At least they're trying to adhere to canon, but I mean, like nothing really happened after Voyager in Star Trek. So, right. Um, I mean, they're free to do whatever they want. I mean, they even blew up Deep Space Nine and made a new Deep Space Nine in the books. Hmm. Haven't read them yet. That's the Typhon Pact. I need to need to read those. Oh, cool. So, do I know? Um, like Dune. You know, they're still writing books for Dune. Dune, Paul Is, it, <laughs> is it like Dune where they just get? you know, guest writers or, you know, kind of like fan fiction writers to, to write books for the, the series that just keep expanding the world of Dune? Is that like, is that how the Star Trek books are written? Or I don't do they know have what kind like of a- committee they've got. I'm sure they have to license everything out through CBS or whatever. Mm. So I, I'm, I'm assuming CBS oversees who writes the books and, and what they're about and, mm. To some extent, but oh, I'll have to look into that. I don't know how their book the writing schedule is, but I mean, they, they at least um, before Dishonor, the Destiny trilogy, and the Typhon Pack series—they're all chronological to each other. Mm-hmm. Like they they build upon the story of the, what they're trying to set up. So th- those are interesting books, which is why I want to read the Typhon Pack because I really enjoyed um, Destiny. Okay. Um, what's another good question? Um. Mm-mm-mm. Well, um, you know, I watched a lot of The Next Generation. and Well, not a lot, because I've, I've probably not even seen... Well, but, no, I've probably Trace seen over seen, half. Trace has seen all of it a lot. Trace has... My dog has seen all of Star Trek, <laughs> I am convinced. And Storin hasn't seen any of it. <laughs> Storin's blind, y'all. <laughs> um, it's a Geordie joke. <laughs> That could be her nickname. Shorty. <laughs> <laughs> Just make her, put her at the steering wheel of your car on the way to California. Because uh, Jordy drove the first season of Next Gen. Oh my god. So. That's great. That's great. <laughs> um, but uh, how, how did the Klingons go from no peace with any other race to, um, you know, like Worf is the... 
um, like security officer on Star Trek Six. So why <laughs> are you saying Star Trek Six is the answer? Well, Star Trek Six uh, Praxis blows up, which is their their main energy source, mm-hmm. and so the the Klingons come to the Federation. They seek uh, a peace accord. The reason, like Worf, was uh, there because in, in Next Gen, like his there was a an ambush where he and, and his parents were killed, and later you find out his dad wasn't actually killed, but. All, all this stuff sort of happens, and he just, you know, kind of got adopted. It's, he's, he's very much like Michael Burnham. Like, a, a tragedy happened in some place, and some people came and adopted him. Okay. Like, he's he's the Michael Burnham of Next Gen, basically, where, like, his parents were murdered, some kind of Romulan attack, and um, he is uh, raised by humans. Got you. Instead of being Michael a human raised by Vulcans. So it's, it's, it's a similar situation, very similar. So it wasn't like he was Klingon, and they allowed... You know, they they integrated into society, and then Klingons were just part of the Federation. He was literally I think, just like I, he's the only raised. one, as far as far as I know. Okay, he's the only Klingon of the Federation, but uh, they're they're technically allies throughout the next gen mm-hmm. era, and sometimes they're allies in Deep Space Nine, and sometimes they're not. I mean, they are technically, but sometimes the Klingons are assholes because Klingons are assholes, <laughs> and and next gen and forward, and they're dumb assholes. Whatever happened to his son? His son, mm-hmm. his son, <laughs> his son what turns. Was his name? Uh, uh, his, Alex? His Alexander. Alexander. Alexander Rozhenko. His son uh, grew up and came to him on Deep Space Nine. Like it's only been like six years, but the son looks like he's in his twenties. So mm. and he had a growth spurt in between, like looking like he was five and looking like uh, he was uh, in his twenties. And and uh, it's like kids uh, now, though. <laughs> Uh, no, but like, all, all alien kids grow up like stupid fast. Like Naomi Wild been on Voyager, she should only be like seven by the end of the series, and like she looks like she's nine or ten by like season four or five. So I mean, it's like it's it's kind of silly how they have giant growth spurts. And Alexander was the same. He was like he went from an infant to like was five. It the same actor? No, no, oh. no, no. Okay, different actor. So what happened him. to him? Uh, he he joined the Klingons, and he was really clumsy. <laughs> I think he died. I can't remember. I haven't hmm. seen all of Deep Space Nine through in a while, but uh, oh. he did. He did get to see his dad marry Judzia. Cool. I think so. I think he was there. I think he was there for that. Cool. Okay. Hmm. What's well, another good question? I don't know any great questions. See, this was a really bad idea. <laughs> <laughs> this is just a short one in case we don't put out a regular episode this week, guys. <laughs> So this will drop whenever that happens. So whenever that happens. So a lot of the stuff might be old news. <laughs> so if someone um, say someone like my husband who doesn't like Star Trek, mm-hmm. could you think of briefly ten episodes that someone who's not interested in sci-fi and has very little experience with Star Trek that would benefit from? These ten episodes, whether in order or not, um, I'm just curious if you, if there are any episodes out there that people could enjoy that aren't specifically into um, science fiction. I mean, I know that there are some episodes that like take place on like the holodeck and like Voyager, where uh, you know, it's, like Fairhaven. Yeah, yeah. So like, I mean, I feel like maybe something like that, where it does, know. it's not overly spacey, but it's still got. The little bits in there. I would so say, I'm just curious. Uh, I would say Measure of a Man would be a great episode. It's one where Data goes on trial for being, if he's sentient or not. Because okay. it's, it's mostly a courtroom. That, that, one, that episode's pretty much a courtroom drama. Mm-hmm. And then I'd also say uh, Offspring, which is the which one where you know he makes his daughter. Mm-hmm. That's a really good episode. and It's good and it's an emotional story. Um, it's it's a good episode for, for anybody. Because, I mean... I mean, I guess it's a little sci-fi-y, but I mean, it's 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 a relatable story about having a child and having your child die mm-hmm. in front of you. It's it's a really good story. Yeah. Um, it's it's weird. A lot of them are involving data. Um, brothers, well, because brothers, that's where it questions humanity and all that. So hey, yeah. brothers is another really good episode. I think I cried in. Um, the Lower Decks is a really good episode. It made me cry. Um, I'm, I'm going to the ones that like hit me on, on, are these on all an the emotion. Same series, or are these all from different series? So far, so far they're all next gen. Okay. <laughs> um, I would say um, watch um, in the Pale Moonlight, uh, which is a DS9 episode. Uh, it's really good. Um, Duet is another Deep Space Nine episode, which is really good. Uh, unfortunately, with Deep Space Nine, a lot of the stuff is you kind of gotta like 
a lot of it's sequential, but Duet's a first season episode, so it's pretty episodic in the first season. Mm -hmm. So you can get away with watching Duet. And Duet's a beautiful episode. It's very World War II, uh, Nazi concentration camp type story. Mm. Um, It's really, really good. really powerful and and really well done. I don't think I'll watch that because I still haven't been able to finish The Boy in the Striped Pajamas. Mm. Yeah. Have you seen that? I have not. Mm. But it's it's very it's it's based off a, off a play, sort of um, that had a very similar like uh, Nazi being on trial for for war crimes uh, for running a concentration camp. It's a very similar type story, and it's really really well done. Gotcha. Um, so I, I'd recommend that. So we're looking at five. Shoot, I don't. <laughs> hey, five is a good number. Stop at. I think um, you know unless there unless there's a couple more that are specifically like. Yeah, people that don't really care for Star Trek would enjoy these episodes. I'm just I'm just trying to think of ones that are like just really solid episodes on their own. Mm. Um, <laughs> <laughs> that's an ep- that's the name of the episode. Yeah. Well, the big goodbye. It's a holodeck episode. Uh, we talked about last week. Um, no, I think it's not going to be last week when you hear this. So, the big goodbye is a holodeck episode where Picard's mostly trying to like just. Live as Dixon Hill. It's like a, it's a noir mm-hmm. cop detective drama thing. One, yeah. So I mean, um, for people who like new noir, they might enjoy that. Okay. And it's you know kind of stand standalone, and there's not a whole lot of spacey stuff in it. Mm-hmm. Like the spacey stuff is kind of like the side story, mm-hmm. and and then them being on the holodeck is most of the story, and then the other little side story is them trying to get them off the holodeck because they don't know how to get them out because it, something goes wrong. Mm-hmm. Star Trek Four is a great movie for people who aren't into Star Trek because it's a very fish out of water, very little space in that sh- uh, in that movie, and it's uh, it's it's almost like a Star Trek comedy. It's close to Star Trek got to doing comedy, I think. What's the fourth one? Well, they go find the whales. Yeah, that one is ridiculously funny. It is really it's, it's really funny and it's really really well done. It's, it's fish like a rom com. It's sort of yeah. It, it is it is sort of like a rom com. And Kirk, Kirk even goes on a date with the, the the mom from Seventh Heaven. So I mean, it's it's it is a kind of a rom com. She is the mom from Seventh Heaven. Oh, I guess I never put two and two together. That. Oh, and and the dad was um, in Star Trek One, the motion picture. So hmm. <laughs> they both have Star that's Trek funny. ties. That's funny. Yes. <laughs> Maybe that's how she got the job. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe. I mean, she wasn't terrible in it, but... Oh, no, they were going to give that role to Eddie Murphy. It was going to be a male role, and it was going to be Eddie Murphy playing the, the whale scientist. That would have been horrible. Oh, wait, I thought, okay, so now I'm picturing, like, Kirk Eddie, with Eddie, Eddie, Eddie Murphy. Murphy. Well, I, yeah, it, 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 <laughs> that would have it been wouldn't amazing. Have been, it would not have been a romantic <laughs> thing, I don't think. But because Star Trek Four was the one they were going for for more laughs, I think yeah. they were thinking, if we get Eddie Murphy as the whale scientist, that would be, that'll be more funny. <sighs> And no, I'm Fox so, stole I'm the so show glad. with his freaking headband, karate tie, belt tie, you know, bathrobe belt well, yeah, tied around he, he, his he ears. He's trying to, yeah, hide his ears, and <laughs> he jumps in the fish tank. He's like, they're not the hell, you're whales. Oh, yeah. he, I mean, there's more. There's more, like, you know. He's great. Spock is great. You know, and, you know, n- n- nuclear nuclear vessels in that one. And usually he... Yeah, Star Trek Four is fantastic. I would recommend Star Trek Four most definitely. Star Trek Six is also great because uh, Star Trek Six is a um, an allegory for the Cold War. Yeah. So if you're interested in history and interested, like you know, it's if you think about it like an allegory for the Cold War, maybe you'd be interested in it because it's it's you know, um, Chernobyl exploding in Russia. Mm is basically what they're doing with Praxis blowing up. I mean, it was like, you know, it was a similar thing, and then that's kind of what brought the to the end of the Cold War. Mm-hmm. And that's what they were trying to do with Star Trek VI. Gotcha. Cool. I don't know. That's that 10, and I'm I'm tired. I can't think of... Anymore. Um, that's okay. That's right off the top of my head. But th- those, are, those, are, those are just some great episodes. Yeah. And a couple great movies that are just really solid, and you don't have to have a lot of science fiction for them. I mean, Pale Moonlight's going to be the hardest one to get into, because it's like in the middle of the Dominion War. But it's such a solid and well-written episode. I think mm-hmm. you can kind of get the gist of it. Yeah. Cool. All right. I had thought of another question, but I don't actually remember what it was because I wanted to let you finish speaking first. Sorry. I should carry a notepad. <laughs> I'm sure your listeners already really know like why you love Star Trek. Um, I hate Star Trek. What do you think I'm doing this for? <laughs> no, I like. 
So we don't really need to ask you why you why you love it and why you continue to watch it, but what was the question I had in my brain? I had a question. Who's the Jar Jar Banks of Star Trek? I like <laughs> Jar Jar Banks. Take so me I would say, if you wish. I would say I would say Neelix, uh, Jake Sixico, and um, Wesley Crusher. Those three. Neelix. Uh, Neelix. I don't know. Neelix is a. Sometimes I like him and sometimes I dislike him. But it's hard to dislike him. He's super creepy. He's creepy. Yes. He's super but, creepy. But he's. Uh, but I like Jar Jar Binks. Um, Mister Jar Jar Binks. Mister the humble servant. There ain't a bit of God to this. <laughs> I love the theory that he was supposed to be the big the Sith. Bad Sith. Yes, like I, I wanted I this to happen so much, and it, so many people makes, hate it. It makes so much sense. I read an article that uh, George Lucas completely switched his like the the stories around because people hated Jar Jar so much. Oh yeah, without a doubt. And that makes me sad because I just want he caved, he caved into the the uh, the audience, right? And like because everyone hated Jar Jar Binks so much, but. And, and and there were major rewrites to episode two. He wasn't going to be a Sith Lord that was silly and klutzy and that was uh, I don't know. Well, no, it's 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 like it's like it's like Yoda. He he, he was going to straighten out and just be menacing mm-hmm. because that's what Yoda, Yoda was overly silly at first. You didn't think you know he was the silly old old guy who turns out to be the wise wizard, you know? Right. And Empire Strikes Back, he was silly, but they overdid the silly with Jar Jar, and everyone hated it. And there were major rewrites to Episode Two, and I, I, I remember reading about them in magazines. I you know I was very very big on following Star Wars back mm-hmm. when the prequels were coming out, and I was like, well, what's happening? So. This was when the internet was in its infancy, so I read a lot of stuff in magazines, and mm-hmm. I read there was massive rewrites to episode two, given the backlash of Jar Jar Binks mm-hmm. and the young Anakin. So guess what? Young Anakin's not going to be in the movie, because we're recasting him for an older actor, because we need to jump ahead ten years. Okay. And everyone hated Jar Jar Binks, so those are the two most hated things about the movie. Okay, so the kid's not an issue anymore, because they've re- already recast him as an older person. So Jar Jar's the problem. So if there's major rewrites, it's going to be on Jar Jar. And then Count Dooku came out of nowhere. He made no sense yeah. because he was riding around the Jar Jar thing. Yeah. Well, we were distracted for a moment about the Jar Jar things. <laughs> <laughs> I, um, I try to be a wealth of knowledge about Star Wars, too. I, I like Star Wars. Yeah. I just haven't liked any of the Disney ones, except for Solo, for, for a strange reason. It was, it was not bad. It, it was a perfectly okay film. Perfectly okay. It was perfectly okay. It didn't make me. It didn't make me want to flip a table. You know, I went to um, B- Dinosaur Barbecue yesterday, and no, you they didn't described tell me. their food as <laughs> lightly slathered. I feel like perfectly okay is a similar oxymoron. <laughs> <laughs> it was a perfectly okay film. It didn't make me hate it, which all the other Star Wars Disney's just every at every turn they just made me hate them. Like, there was nothing about them that was redeeming, almost. Yeah. It's well, you know, sometimes we have those movies where we have to watch them again and again and again and again and again to find some distance with our love of the story or the idea in order to appreciate the film for what it was. I had an experience with a movie similar to that. But it is not... It's science fiction, but it's definitely not star-related. So I won't get into that. But, um, but yeah, I'm sorry. I'm sorry that, that that's happening for you. <laughs> they ruined it. <laughs> <laughs> um, but back to Star Trek. Um, how about the Abrams verse? Is it the JJ verse? It's the Kel- it- it's the Kelvin timeline. Kelvin timeline. Okay. Why is it called the Kelvin timeline? Because the Kelvin is the ship that was there when Nero came through the time portal, which is where the universe split. Okay. The, where the time shift happened. That wasn't Nero's ship. The it was George was the- Kirk's ship. Okay. That's yeah. Okay. Yeah, Nero so ship was the Narada. Okay, cool. So I guess you could call it the Narada timeline, but it's <laughs> it's officially called the Kelvin the timeline. Kelvin timeline. Okay, so with the Kelvin timeline, obviously it coincides. It can it kind of commingles because obviously we've seen our Spock and that Spock. Together. Yeah, because because the, they made it both a continuation and a reboot at the same time, which, right? Which, which, which I thought was cool. Which which was clever to do. Mm-hmm. So, being that they're separate, I mean, I I don't know if they're are they planning on making any more. Uh, there's right now the Paramount says they're making two new movies. 
Uh, one will be Star Trek Four okay. of the Kelvin verse, mm-hmm. and the other one supposedly will be the Quentin Tarantino's, which is supposedly going to be in the Prime timeline or, or a different timeline altogether. Oh, okay, uh, cool. Um, I really enjoy the Kelvin timeline. Three was the Beyond was my favorite. The third one. You know, I I I really need to see it again. It's the only one out of the three so far that I didn't immediately go out and buy because I loved the other ones so much. And then that one, I don't know. I wouldn't say I really liked the movie. And I remember thinking, wow, people said it was terrible, but I loved it. But I never went out and just bought the movie. Hmm. Um, it's, it's by far my favorite of, of the three. It's it's very much it, it it felt the most like Star Trek to me. It was it was the most Star Trek feeling movie since Star Trek Six. Yeah, I mean it was more Star Trek feeling to me than the next gen movies. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Well, I liked it. I just it, I, for some reason it wasn't I wasn't pulled to go buy it. Yeah, I mean like uh, I, I still plan to, but it's just I, like, I feel like not on my top. Uh, my, my, my biggest mind. my biggest complaint I feel like the ending was drawn out. Like where they're where they're punching like him. They're flying around the city because of the gravity's wonky. Mm-hmm. I feel like that part was kind of dragged out. Mm-hmm. A little too long. Yeah, it was it was not not my favorite part. But um, I think uh, I, I, overall it's my, definitely my favorite of the of the three films. So okay. that's good. But um, I think I think this is our uh, good for our uh, ending point. Uh, I think Aaron's just arrived, so we can record a regular episode. But um, thanks for wanting to do a little short um, short stint with me, Holly. Yeah, I wish I had um, prepared some questions for this. Yeah, this was totally spur of the minute, spur of the moment, and yeah. uh, uh, there it is. Well, thank you so much for listening. Live long and prosper, one and all. All right. And uh, so, yeah, thanks thanks for checking that out. Uh, sorry, it was, a, it was a little bit different show today. I did try to get a replacement co-host. It, it just just didn't work out. Uh, I didn't know Aaron was going on vacation until, like, Thursday, and we record on Sunday. So um, I didn't have a whole lot of time to grab some money. I, I did a Facebook Live, and uh, one of our friends was wanting to join us, but something came up, and he was unable to make it. So, yeah, it was just... Uh, one of those things when I wanted to get something out for you, and I remembered Holly and I had a little bit of uh, recording for you guys. So uh, here's our strange off week. So we'll be back next week with Heroes and Demons. We're going to do the Voyager episode, Heroes and Demons. So uh, thank you all so much for listening. All our music is funded by Warp 11. You can find them at warp11.com or warp11 on Twitter. Uh, although our intro is done by Dave Wilkes. Uh, on Twitter, you can find us at Synthaholic Duo. I am at David underscore J underscore Duncan. Aaron's at Blackbird2004. And Holly's at Lunar Thistle. Uh, join the Facebook conversation, facebook.com slash group slash Synthaholics. That way you can uh, join in and, and uh, join in on the fun and enjoy uh, the conversations we have. And if we ever do more Facebook Lives, you'll be able to see that there because uh, I usually do those in the channel. You can email us at synthaholics at yahoo.com. Uh, that way we can uh, read your emails on the on the air. Uh, you can also send us voice clips. Those are always fun to, to listen to, and that way we can respond. You can hear your own voice on the podcast. If you ever want to send us a voice clip, you're, you're more than uh, welcome to. We, we'd love that. Uh, check us out on Patreon, patreon.com slash synthaholics. Uh, that way you can, you know, toss us a buck or two, keep the show going. It just is enormously helpful to us. You know, a buck a month, it's not a whole lot to ask, and we just really appreciate it. It just, uh, you know, helps grease the wheels of the podcasting because um, we're doing, you know, it just the, the monthly cost of the, the, the hosting and as well as the, the, the yearly cost of the website. So anything you can do uh, helps us out so very much, and we really appreciate it. Um, you know, lastly, you can just uh, go online to iTunes or I guess it's Apple Podcast now. Give us a uh, stars and rating and review. We we love seeing stars and reviews. It helps us get seen in the algorithm uh, because that's you know that's one of the most important things uh, out there is getting uh, rating and, re- and reviews on iTunes because that's how the algorithm propagates out the show and it it, it matters uh, so much to us and it matters to iTunes and that's how. Uh, people can find us easier. The, the better ratings and more reviews we have, uh, the better for us and uh, better for everyone, I think it'll be. So it'll spread the joy of Synthaholics around. So, uh, again, thank you all so much for listening. Live long and prosper, one and all. It is big 50 million miles aside of Mars Well, McCoy, my boy, come mix me a drink Before the night's over I'll puke in a sink and we'll cry till we laugh And we'll both shit our pants 
you're the best drinking friend.